is here. Now, broadcasting from, from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. America, Mark Levin, our number, 877-381-3811, 877-381-3811, July 5, 2016, James Comey. Good morning, I'm here to give you an update on the FBI's investigation of Secretary Clinton's use of a personal email system during her time as Secretary of State. After a tremendous amount of work over the last year, the FBI is completing its investigation and referring to the case to the Department of Justice for a prosecutive decision. What I would like to do today is tell you three things. What we did, what we found, and what we are recommending to the Department of Justice. There will be an unusual statement in at least a couple of ways. First, I'm going to include more detail about our process than I ordinarily would. Because I think the American people deserve those details in a case of intense public interest. Second, I have not coordinated or reviewed this statement in any way with the Department of Justice or any other part of the government. They do not know what I'm about to say. I want to start by thanking the FBI employees who did remarkable work on the case. Once you have a better sense of how much we have done, you will understand why I'm so grateful and proud of their efforts. So first, what have we done? The investigation began as a referral from the Intelligence Community Inspector General in connection with Secretary Clinton's use of a personal email server during her time as Secretary of State. The referral focused on whether classified information was transmitted on that personal system. Our investigation looked at whether there is evidence classified information was improperly stored or transmitted on that personal system in violation of of a federal statute making it a felony to mishandle classified information, either intentionally or in a grossly negligent way, or a second statute making it a misdemeanor to knowingly remove classified information from appropriate systems or storage facilities. Consistent with our counterintelligence responsibilities, we've also investigated to determine whether there is evidence of computer intrusion in connection with a personal email server by any foreign power uh, other hostile actors. I've so far used the singular term email server in describing the referral that began our investigation. Turns out to have been more complicated than that. Secretary Clinton used several different servers and administrators of those servers during her four years at the State Department and used numerous mobile devices to view and send email on that personal domain. As new servers and equipment were employed, old servers were taken out of service, stored and decommissioned in various ways. Piecing all that back together to gain as full an understanding as possible of the ways in which personal email was used for government work has been a painstaking undertaking requiring thousands of hours of effort. For example, when one of Secretary Clinton's original personal servers was decommissioned in 2013, the email software was removed. Doing that didn't remove the email content, but it was like removing the frame from a huge finished jigsaw puzzle and dumping the pieces on the floor. The effect was that millions of email fragments 
end up unsorted in the server's unused or slack space. We searched through all of it to see what was there and what parts of the puzzle could be put back together. FBI investigators also read all the approximately 30,000 emails provided by Secretary Clinton to the State Department in December 2014, where an email was assessed as possibly containing classified information. The FBI referred the email to any U.S. government agency that was a likely owner of information in the email, so that agency could make a determination as to whether the email contained classified information at the time it was sent or received or whether there was reason to classify the email now, even if its content was not classified at the time it was sent. That is a process sometimes referred to as up-classifying. From the group of 30,000 emails returned to the State Department, 110 emails and 52 email chains have been determined by the owning agency to contain classified information at the time they were sent or received. Eight of those chains contained information that was top secret at the time they were sent. Thirty-six chains contained secret information at the time. Eight contained confidential information, the lowest level of classification. Separate from those, about 2,000 additional emails were up-classified to make them confidential. The information in those had not been classified at the time the emails were sent. There's more. The FBI also discovered several thousand work-related emails that were not in the group of 30,000 and were returned by Secretary Clinton to the State Department in 2014. We found those additional emails in a variety of ways. Some have been deleted over the years, and we found traces of them on devices that supported or were connected to the private email domain. Others were found by reviewing the archived government email accounts of people who had been government employees at the same time as Secretary Clinton, including high-ranking officials at other agencies, people with whom a Secretary of State might naturally correspond. This helped us recover work-related emails that were not among the 30,000 produced to State. So others were recovered from the laborious review of the millions of email fragments dumped into the Slack space of the server decommissioned in 2013. With respect to the thousands of emails we found that were not among those produced to State, Agencies have concluded that three of those were classified at the time they were sent or received, one at the secret level, two at the confidential level. There were no additional top-secret emails found. Finally, none of those we found have since been up-classified. I should add here that we found no evidence that any of the additional work-related emails were intentionally deleted in an effort to conceal them. Our assessment is that, like many email users, Secretary Clinton periodically deleted emails or emails were purged from the system when devices were changed because she was not using a government account or even a commercial account like Gmail. There was no archiving at all of her emails, so it's not surprising that we discovered emails that were not on Secretary Clinton's system in 2014 when she produced the 30,000 emails to the State Department. So it could also be that some of the additional work-related emails were recovered among those deleted as personal, by Secretary Clinton's lawyers when they reviewed and sorted her emails for production in 2014. Now, the lawyers doing the sorting for Secretary Clinton in 2014 did not individually read the content of all her emails, as we did for those available to us. Instead, they relied on header information and used search terms to try and find all work-related emails about the reported more than 60,000 total emails remaining on Clinton's personal system in 2014. It's highly likely their search teams missed some work-related emails and that we later found them, for example, in the mailboxes of other officials or in Slack space of a server. It's also likely that there are other work-related emails they did not produce uh, to state and that we did not find elsewhere and that are now gone because they deleted all emails they did not return to state. The lawyers cleaned their devices in such a way as to preclude complete forensic recovery. Why'd they do that? We've conducted interviews and technical examination to attempt to understand how that sorting was done by our lawyers, although we do not have complete visibility because we're not able to fully reconstruct the electronic record of that sorting. We believe our investigation has been sufficient to give us reasonable confidence there were no intentional misconduct in connection with that sorting. Well, why would they permanently delete stuff? Anyway, let me just keep reading. 
And of course, in addition to our technical work, we interviewed many people from those involved in setting up and maintaining the various iterations of Secretary Clinton's personal server to staff members with whom she corresponded on email to those involved in the email production of state and finally Secretary Clinton herself. By the way, she was interviewed with her lawyers present for less than five hours and she was not under oath. Just so you know. Her lawyers weren't forced to testify under the crime fraud exception. Her lawyers destroyed emails without reading them, despite the fact their communications director had said that they read every email. They clearly had not. And they permanently deleted them. So their work couldn't be reviewed. Although we did not find clear evidence that Secretary Clinton and her colleagues intended to violate laws governing the handling of classified information, there's evidence that they were extremely careless in their handling of very sensitive, highly classified information. They didn't find evidence of that, ladies and general, uh, gentlemen. But staff, staff, used hammers to destroy all her previous cell phones. They used hammers to destroy her previous cell phones. Her lawyers didn't read the emails they deleted. The emails were deleted permanently so they couldn't be resurrected. But they didn't find evidence of any wrongdoing. Intentional wrongdoing. They go on. Let's see here. While not the focus of our investigation, we also developed evidence that the security culture of the State Department in general, with respect to the use of unclassified email systems in particular, was generally lacking in the kind of care for classified information found elsewhere in the government. Really? And former presidents of the United States, former vice presidents of the United States, took classified information home or brought them to their businesses. But that doesn't seem to matter in the Trump investigation. With respect to a potential computer intrusion by hostile actors, we didn't find direct evidence that Clinton's personal email domain in its various configurations since 2009 was successfully hacked. But given the nature of the system and of the actors potentially involved, we assess that we would be unlikely to see such direct evidence. We do assess that hostile actors gained access to the private commercial email accounts of people with whom Secretary Clinton was in regular contact from her personal account. We also assessed that Secretary Clinton's use of a personal email domain was both known by a large number of people and readily apparent. See, making excuses. She also used her personal email extensively while outside the United States, including sending and receiving work-related emails in the territory of sophisticated adversaries. Given that combination of factors, we assess it is possible that hostile actors gained access to Secretary Clinton's personal email account. So that's what we found. Finally, with respect to our recommendation to the Department of Justice. In our system, the prosecutors make the decision about whether charges are appropriate based on evidence the FBI has helped collect. Although we don't normally make public our recommendations to the prosecutors, we frequently make recommendations and engage in productive conversations with prosecutors about what resolution may be appropriate given the evidence. In this case, given the importance of the matter, I think unusual transparency is in order. Although there's evidence of potential violations of federal statutes regarding the handling of classified information, our judgment is that no reasonable prosecutor would bring such a case. Prosecutors necessarily weigh a number of factors before bringing charges. There are obvious considerations, like the strength of the evidence, especially regarding intent, responsible decisions. Also consider the context of a person's actions and how similar situations have been handled in the past. Looking bad at our, back at our investigations of the mishandling or removal of classified information, we cannot find a case that would support bringing criminal charges on these facts. All the cases prosecuted involve some combination, clearly intentional, willful mishandling of classified information, or vast quantities of materials exposed in such a way as to support an inference of intentional misconduct, or indications of disloyalty to the United States, or efforts to obstruct justice. We just don't see these things here. So, hammering the devices, 
permanently deleting emails and deleting emails that have not been read. <coughs> they don't see anything there. This is not to suggest that a similar circumstance as a person who engaged in this activity would face no consequences. To the contrary, those individuals are often subject to security administrative sanctions. But that's not what we are deciding now, and it goes on, so they left her alone. Here we have a grand jury with two grand juries, with Trump. Here we have a search warrant. Here we have a SWAT team. SWAT team. So what they're going to try and do is show, well, there's real obstruction in the Trump case, but not in the Hillary case. That is a lie. That is a lie, in my view. The lawyers, the staff, Hillary Clinton, they did everything they could to cover up, to mislead, to deceive, to misdirect. And they were treated vastly differently than Trump and his lawyers. His lawyers have had to testify in front of a federal grand jury. They had to give up all their notes and information that they discussed with their client, Donald Trump. Not in the case of Hillary's lawyers, despite the fact that their fingerprints were all over the emails and those emails and the disposition of those emails. And same with the staffers who destroyed the mobile devices with their hammers. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. If we've learned anything over the past two years, it's that unexpected things can happen. For example, average IRA and 401k balances fell 20% last year, according to Fidelity. We didn't expect that. But here's something that could help if you have an IRA or 401k. Physical gold in your IRA. The World Gold Council says even central banks are buying tons of gold. Now what does that tell you? Learn why many Americans are turning to a gold IRA with Augusta Precious Metals. They're the best. I recommend them to my friends and family. You should call Augusta and get their ultimate guide to gold IRAs. Feels good to know there's another savings option. Diversity is the key. Call Augusta Precious Metals at 8774-GOLD-IRA. That's 8774-GOLD-IRA. 8774-GOLD-IRA. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions and get disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. Any and all State Department activities, not just communications involving the key words Benghazi or Libya, will potentially make an email a federal record. Given the high stakes involved, I would have imagined staff could have simply conducted a manual review of every document using key words as a shortcut, unfortunately, leaves the process open to being second-guessed. does more than that. It's not a thorough search, is it? Is that what they're attacking Trump for? And there's another big difference between Trump and Hillary Clinton. He was president. She was not. If we've learned anything over the past two years, it's that unexpected things can happen. For example, average IRA and 401k balances fell 20% last year, according to Fidelity. We didn't expect that. But here's something that could help if you have an IRA or 401k. Physical gold in your IRA. The World Gold Council says even central banks are buying tons of gold. Now what does that tell you? Learn why many Americans are turning to a gold IRA with Augusta Precious Metals. They're the best. I recommend them to my friends and family. You should call Augusta and get their ultimate guide to gold IRAs. Feels good to know there's another savings option. Diversity is the key. Call Augusta Precious Metals at 8774-GOLD-IRA. That's 8774-GOLD-IRA. 8774-GOLD-IRA. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions and get disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. Mark Levin, the thunder on the right. Call in now, 877-381-3811. You're very familiar with our friend Jim Jordan. He's chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. Jim, you are seeking a document related to the Mar-a-Lago investigation. Could you tell us what's going on? 
Yeah, we went to scope memo, uh, Mark. Thanks for having us on. Um, yeah. In simple terms, there's an order given when there's a special counsel form. You know this. Uh, the order lays out a sort of a broader scope of what the investigation is. But then there's a memo typically, not always, but, well, we think always. It's been our experience. There's a memorandum that actually gives more detail about what, in fact, the special counsel is supposed to focus on, what are the parameters of that investigation. If you remember, Mr. Rosenstein issued a memorandum about a scope memorandum about three months after the initial order that gave a lot of context to what they were doing. That was not released until 2020, uh, even though it was issued, uh, that memorandum was sent on in August of 2017. So we're, we want to know that plus any other communications surrounding Jack Smith and the special counsel, because if it looks like, based on what the press is saying, Mark, that he's going to indict the former president and maybe more importantly, the guy who's leading in every single poll uh, every single mm-hmm. poll in the 2024 presidential race, it looks like they're going to indict him, potential and obstruction uh, uh, charges. And we'd like to know kind of what's going on and how this investigation proceeded. Is it amazing how little they will reveal to the American people through Congress, whether yep. it is uh, information related to the Bidens? And how can they justify not appointing a special counsel to investigate Joe Biden and all these shell corporations and the laptop and all the rest? <laughs> That, that specifically finger him. And yet, when yeah. it comes to Donald Trump, they appoint a special counsel in a way that you're not supposed to. That is, special counsel for the American people, you appoint a special counsel because of a potential conflict of interest within the government. Within the right. government. So right. that the appointment would be made for Biden. It would not be made for Trump. They're trying to give the appearance of independence here, aren't they? Even though the special counsel yeah. points to the uh, reports of the attorney general. Yeah, when they announced this, if I remember right, they announced the formation of, of Jack Smith and the special counsel after they were after, uh, you, you know, uh, seven months ago w- when when they when this uh, was happening. And then shortly thereafter, they announced one for Joe Biden. So it's again, I think it's for appearances, but it's very real when you have these news reports saying that the special counsel is going to indict the former president. And here's the other thing that bothers me, this double standard. This document that, that Chairman Comer, that we're trying to get uh, made public for the American people to see, I mean, this is a document the FBI prepared. They created this document based on what a credible source who they had worked for for 10 years, who they paid hundreds of thousand dollars, information that source told the FBI. They create this 1023 document that says our source told us Joe Biden had conversations with a foreign national about money for certain actions that he would take. That's what that's what Mr. Comer, who's seen the document, has said. That's what it involved. And how much you want to bet this confidential human source, Mark, how much you want to bet he's a lot more credible than Christopher Steele was, who put together the dossier Mm -hmm. that they used to spy on a presidential campaign. I would bet my house this source is better than Christopher Steele. And the document, that 1023, is better than that dossier, which they used two days after they got it. According to the Durham report, they used two days after they got it to put in a draft FISA application without substantiating anything. Any of the of the allegations that they didn't uh, they didn't validate a one ever, and they used it to spy on a presidential campaign. Well, Mr. Chairman, there's more reason than ever to release it because we have a Washington Post piece from last night where Jamie Raskin is revealing information spinning where we're told that Bill Barr saw the information and he didn't care, so he sat on it. Now it creates more questions than answers. Um, And now there's leaks out of the Department of Justice or the FBI about the document. So now they're telling us what's in the document from a radical left perspective. And uh, there's more reason now why people like me who communicate with 14 and a half million people should have this information so we can discuss what's in the document rather than just like Russia collusion where people are leaking information to the Washington Post and not providing public information, right? No, you're exactly right. The American people have a right to see this stuff. That's what this in the end is about. It's about we the people. And you know, if this was a 1023 from a confidential human source who was credible, who had been paid hundreds of thousands of dollars by the American taxpayer through our FBI, and it was about Trump, you know CNN would already have a copy of it. Everyone knows that. But no, 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 it's about Biden, so we can't see it. Only the chairman in the camera can view this document. That's, that's ridiculous. And oh, by the way, you can't see this document. Only, in, only, in, in, uh, only the chairman can see it. 
Uh, we can then you, no one else is, is allowed to. But we're going to indict the former president, the guy leading in the polls by the by the Justice Department of, of his opponent. Like what is what is going and on? And it looks here? like, this Mr. Chairman, they're they're going to attack on process. In other words, uh, let me let me just lay this out and then get your input on this. Hillary Clinton had over 30,000 emails, really 60,000, 30,000 emails. There was classified information on her private server. Her lawyers decided what emails were and were not relevant. Her lawyers permanently deleted thousands and thousands of emails. They did not go through the arduous task of actually reading the emails. They looked at headers. That's how they made a determination of what would be reviewed and turned over and what would not be. Her staff used hammers to destroy her prior cell phones. And, uh, of course, when she was interviewed, she was interviewed for just a few hours where the lawyers who were in question were representing her uh, at the event. She was not under oath. Then you look at Donald Trump. They take one of, more, more than one of his lawyers. They go to a, an Obama judge on her last day as the chief judge. Last day. She orders mm-hmm. a, a crime fraud exception for his main lawyer to be interviewed by the grand jury and the prosecutor, turning over notes and information that is discussions with his own client. He's done this with others as well. Then they get, you know, earlier they get a warrant. They raid his home. Uh, with a SWAT team, uh, because they say they've had enough, it's, they've run out of time. I want to ask you a question. Uh, first of all, are you sick and tired of Bill Barr and people like that going on TV, basically encouraging the Department of Justice to indict the former president? And secondly, how is it that Hillary Clinton wasn't in an orange jumpsuit? She was Secretary of State. We're talking about a former president of the United States. Uh, how, how do you view all this? No, it's, I, I'm sick and tired of it like the American people are, the double standard, the one set of rules for us regular folk, another set if you're part of the elite connected class here in D.C. I'll tell you this, too, about Secretary Clinton. When she was under oath in front of the Benghazi committee, in my second round of questions, I remember, I asked her, I said, Secretary Clinton, 60,000 emails. We don't want to see the ones about your kid's wedding. We don't want to see the ones about the you know, personal stuff. We, that, that's this America. We don't want that. But we don't necessarily trust that you and your lawyers will decide what's work-related, what's, what's personal. So how about we do it this way? How about we take a retired federal judge? We can debate and we can figure out who – we can work together who that's going to be. Let's take a retired, a retired federal judge and let them be the arbiter. Let them decide this is personal. You shouldn't be able to see this committee. Uh, this, is, this is work-related. You should be able to see this. How about we do it that way? And, of course, they said no. No, they couldn't do it. Not only – that's what we offer. Now, think about that with the, the way they've treated Trump compared to that. I offered her that from the committee. I said, you know, why, why, don't, you, why don't you take that deal? No, no, no. We'll decide. Mm-hmm. We, our lawyers will decide. We'll do just what you described, Mark. That's, that's, that's Republicans being reasonable and, and, and being fair. They wouldn't even take that deal. But with President Trump, think how they've treated him. That's what people are so sick of, and it's – and now that they're going to indict the guy leading in every single poll after what they've done to him for eight years, spied on his campaign, spied on four people, Manafort, Papadopoulos, Carter Page, and, and uh, uh, I'm forgetting the fourth all, but four people in, in the campaign. Oh, Mike Flynn, four people they spied on his campaign. Then, then Mueller does the investigation. Mueller comes the day Mueller testifies in front of our committee and says, no collusion, no conspiracy. What do they do the very next day? They pick up on a phone call the very next day, July 24th, I think it was, 2019. The very next day, they say, oh, we're going to get him on this phone call he had with Zelensky. And some anonymous source with no firsthand knowledge who worked for Joe Biden is the basis of an impeachment. And it just keeps going. And they raid his home, as you talked about. And now they're going to, like, it never ends. It never mm-hmm. ends. And that's what, that's what drives everyone crazy. Well, it's a huge problem in this country. It's a very big, big problem. And I would just say to the Republicans who are running against Trump, um, you know, I get this question, will this help or hurt Trump? It's going to help Trump because people do not like the fact that somebody who is an innocent man is turned into the all-time criminal of the United States. We know they've gone after his taxes. They've gone after his companies. We know they've gone after his kids. We know they bring charges of sexual abuse. Very strange. He wasn't found guilty of rape. That was the allegation. And one lawyer said to me, 
gee, you should have handled this case. How are you found guilty of a lesser offense? It's a civil case. It's not a lesser included offense. It's a criminal case. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> that's very criminal. And then you go on. You go on with the phony impeachments. And then you go on with this criminal investigation yeah. and January 6th criminal investigation. And then you see how the Department of Justice, the same department that you've pointed out many, many times, abuses now uh, whistleblowers at the FBI, what they've done to those people. And you see with the parents and the pro-lifers and all the rest, and here's mm-hmm. Trump. Mm-hmm. We don't have a justice system, Mr. Chairman. We don't no. have one anymore. No, and we've got to fix that. And the way you fix it, you, you do legislation, you look at the appropriation process, you, do the, you use all the tools that we have to try to fix it. But in the end, you, you ultimately, you've you got to have an attorney general who's going to you know, follow the rule of law and administer the rule of law in an equal, fair fashion. Americans instinctively get fairness. That's why the country, you're right. If this happens to President Trump, I think his numbers go up even more because Americans fundamentally understand fairness. From the time you're a kid, if your brother gets two cookies and you get one, you know it's not fair. Like, it's built in us. It's the way God made us. It, uh, and Americans get it. Uh, it's so they just get it, and they know what's going on here is not fair. And it, the, the examples just can – look at Durham's, Durham's report. There was intelligence, credible intelligence, that comes into our government in the summer of 2016 that says the whole Trump-Russia stuff, the whole dossier stuff, it was all coming from the Clinton campaign. They put that in a memo. They send that memo to Comey and Strzok. Comey and Strzok, do not share that with the guys doing the crossfire hurricane, the agents on the case. And when Durham interviewed one of these agents, he showed in the memo. The guy read the memo. After he reads the memo, this is in Durham's report, page 88 of the report. He reads the memo. He becomes visibly upset, emotional, has to get up, walk out of the room, comes back in, and basically <laughs> says it is BS that they didn't share that information with us. This could have changed how we handled this whole case. That's what's going on, and me- Americans understand that that is wrong, that is not fair. Mm-hmm. And they appointed this special counsel because he's known to be a reckless rogue. He was with the former governor of Virginia. Where the Supreme Court uh-huh. unanimously overturned the verdict. He was yep. with even uh, John Edwards, where the jury wouldn't give him what he wanted. He's, he was the former head of the public integrity section when the uh, IRS was going after the Tea Party, and I was told he was pushing that agenda too. He was He's looking a very to bad guy. people. Yes. Holy cow. Um, All right, my friend. Here. Thinking about Keep up the good work. <laughs> we God want you bless too, you, brother. Buddy. Thanks for all you do. See you, man. All right. Bye-bye. There you have it. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. If we've learned anything over the past two years, it's that unexpected things can happen. For example, average IRA and 401k balances fell 20% last year. According to Fidelity, we didn't expect that. But here's something that could help if you have an IRA or 401k. Physical gold in your IRA. The World Gold Council says even central banks are buying tons of gold. Now what does that tell you? Learn why many Americans are turning to a gold IRA with Augusta Precious Metals. They're the best. I recommend them to my friends and family. You should call Augusta and get their ultimate guide to gold IRAs. Feels good to know there's another savings option. Diversity is the key. Call Augusta Precious Metals at 8774 Gold IRA. That's 8774 Gold IRA. 8774 Gold IRA. Consult your financial professionals before making investment decisions and get disclosures at AugustaPreciousMetals.com. Chris Christie is announcing he's running for president, and uh, most of the time we're looking at his back. Have you noticed that, Mr. Producer? And in addition, he talked about, couldn't hear most of it, John Kennedy writing Profiles in Courage. Actually, John Kennedy didn't write Profiles in Courage, even though that was the, the effort to create that impression. A guy by the name of Theodore Sorensen actually wrote Profiles in Courage, speechwriter among his closest advisors. <clears throat> Excuse me. You heard Jim Jordan. You've heard from me. You see what's likely coming. And basically, Chris Christie, much like Bill Barr, made it clear that they're 
their goal in life, at least in the short run, is to take out Donald Trump. And I think if they were really sober in their thinking and had a historical context for what they were saying, they would understand that even though they don't personally like Donald Trump anymore, even though both worked for them, one directly, one indirectly, I never worked for Donald Trump. Nonetheless, when you see what's going on, this kind of Soviet-style so-called justice system, you need to stand up against it. Regardless, <coughs> excuse me, regardless of who the target is. But these are not big enough men in stature to do that. These are not big enough men in stature to do that. And the more they talk about this, the more history one day will remember them. They'll be remembered, but not as they expect to be remembered. Does anybody know what today is? You know, Mr. Producer, I've watched a lot of news today to see if this would be even mentioned. Does anybody know what today is? It's the anniversary of D-Day. When our men, Canadians, British, Aussies, New Zealanders, but mostly we, started the first steps towards saving Europe. D-Day. More on that in a moment. This segment of the podcast is exclusively sponsored by Pure Talk. Pure Talk offers great coverage and can save your family money on your wireless bill every single month. Go to puretalk.com to find the plan that's right for you. Thank you again for listening, and thank you so much for this sponsorship, Pure Talk. He's here. He's here. Now, broadcasting them from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. You know, America, D-Day, January 6th. I don't think I would have picked today to announce that I'm running for president like Chris Christie did. June 6th. What did I say? June 6th. Uh, January 6th. We know. I don't think Christie should have picked today. I think it's disrespectful, as a matter of fact. Couldn't wait one day or couldn't do it the day before. I suspect the reason he did it today is because he didn't even know it was the anniversary of D-Day. While in his announcement, he takes a short walk through history. He didn't, or shouldn't, in my view, have picked this day. And I do notice that the vast majority of the media has ignored this day. How much you want to bet it wasn't taught in schools that are still teaching today. The D-Day invasion, short summary from the History Channel, Cut 17, Go. Well, D-Day was a, obviously the most important single fight of that war. And, of course, had we lost it, there's no telling what the outcome would have been. Since the American entry into the war, American generals had been agitating for an opportunity to fight the Germans directly. The D-Day invasion, invasion of Normandy, in June 1944, represented the cutting edge of this offensive. The essential condition that underwrote the success of D-Day was the fact that Germany had been bled virtually to death by fighting on the Eastern Front uh, for several years against the Red Army and the Soviet Union before D-Day ever happened. The Germans had been preparing for this invasion as long as the Americans and the British had been, and they had been digging in, and they knew that they could inflict appalling casualties on the first units ashore. Well, somebody had to do it. And so the soldiers went, and indeed, 
those first units did suffer very high rates of death and wounding. It's one thing to go on a beach with sand dunes. It's something else when you've got enemy on top of these bluffs. And for some reason, our naval gunnery was either off or something went wrong there. They couldn't destroy those gun emplacements. But eventually, the weight of the invasion took hold. The numbers of Americans, the numbers of craft, allowed the Americans and the British to establish a beachhead. And once they established a beachhead, then they could bring more and more soldiers and equipment ashore. One thing I don't think either the Japanese or the Germans really counted on was what it meant to come up against a massive capitalist industrial power. The ability to build stuff on a massive scale with massive numbers was just something they hadn't really anticipated. If you look back at the old photographs and the footage of that armada, out there off the coast of the war. I don't think they've ever assembled before, after, anything like that. Eventually, it was the technology, it was the weight of American weapons that tipped the balance. But at the very beginning, it was the soldiers, the ones who splashed ashore, the ones who knew that in the first wave, lots and lots of them would never come back. And those are the ones who made possible everything that followed. The rangers who went in first and the waves that came after them stood right up to it. And there was more bravery that day than one can hardly imagine. They got very nauseous on those pontoon boats. They got, as soon as those doors fell down, many of them were murdered right on the boats. Murder rate was enormous, killing rate. And I think about that battle and all the battles in American history. And the utter disrespect that these deceased men, most men, have received at our colleges and universities, by our media. and by the Marxists and the Democrat Party. Makes me sick to my stomach. Sick to my stomach. People becoming filthy rich. 1619 Project. White dominant culture and privilege that America is not worth fighting for. We get this pablum day in and day out. Ronald Reagan, June 6, 1984, 40th anniversary D-Day, cut 18, go. Forty summers have passed since the battle that you fought here. You were young the day you took these cliffs. Some of you were hardly more than boys with the deepest joys of life before you. Yet you risked everything here. Why? Why did you do it? Well, what impelled you to put aside the instinct for self-preservation and risk your lives to take these cliffs? What inspired all the men of the armies that met here? We look at you and somehow we know the answer. It was faith and belief. It was loyalty and love. The men of Normandy had faith that what they were doing was right. Faith that they fought for all humanity faith that a just God would grant them mercy on this beachhead or on the next. It was the deep knowledge, and pray God we have not lost it, that there is a profound moral difference between the use of force for liberation and the use of force for conquest. You were here to liberate, not to conquer, and so you and those others did not doubt your cause, and you were right not to doubt you all knew that some things are worth dying for. One's country is worth dying for, and democracy is worth dying for because it's the most deeply honorable form of government ever devised by man. All of you loved liberty, 
All of you were willing to fight tyranny, and you knew the people of your countries were behind you. The Americans who fought here that morning knew word of the invasion was spreading through the darkness back home. They fought or felt in their hearts, though they couldn't know in fact, that in Georgia they were filling the churches at 4 a.m. In Kansas, they were kneeling on their porches and praying. And in Philadelphia, they were ringing the Liberty Bell. Something else helped the men of D-Day. Their rock-hard belief that Providence would have a great hand in the events that would unfold here. That God was an ally in this great cause. And so the night before the invasion, when Colonel Wolverton asked his parachute troops to kneel with him in prayer, he told them, do not bow your heads, but look up so you can see God and ask his blessing in what we are about to do. Also that night, General Matthew Ridgway on his cot, listening in the darkness for the promise God made to Joshua, I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. These are the things that impelled them. These are the things that shaped the unity of the Allies. When the war was over, there were lives to be rebuilt and governments to be returned to the people. There were nations to be reborn. Above all, there was a new peace to be assured. These were huge and daunting tasks, but the Allies summoned strength from the faith, belief, loyalty, and love of those who fell here. They rebuilt a new Europe together. There was first a great reconciliation among those who had been enemies, all of whom had suffered so greatly. The United States did its part, creating the Marshall Plan to help rebuild our allies and our former enemies. The Marshall Plan led to the Atlantic Alliance, a great alliance that serves to this day as our shield for freedom, for prosperity, and for peace. In spite of our great efforts and successes, not all that followed the end of the war was happier planned. Some liberated countries were lost. The great sadness of this loss echoes down to our own time in the streets of Warsaw, Prague, and East Berlin. The Soviet troops that came to the center of this continent did not leave when peace came. They're still there, uninvited, unwanted, unyielding, almost 40 years after the war. Because of this, Allied forces still stand on this continent. Today, as 40 years ago, our armies are here for only one purpose, to protect and defend democracy. The only territories we hold are memorials like this one and graveyards where our heroes rest. We in America have learned bitter lessons from two world wars. It is better to be here ready to protect the peace than to take blind shelter across the sea, rushing to respond only after freedom is lost. We've learned that isolationism never was and never will be an acceptable response to tyrannical governments with an expansionist intent. But we try always to be prepared for peace, prepared to deter aggression, prepared to negotiate the reduction of arms, and yes, prepared to reach out again in the spirit of reconciliation. In truth, there is no reconciliation we would welcome more than a reconciliation with the Soviet Union, so together we can listen, lessen the risk of war now and forever. What a tremendous man. Now, Donald Trump, on the 75th commemoration of D-Day, the man, the Biden administration, and the Democrats want to put in prison. Cut 19, go. They battled not for control and domination, but for liberty, democracy, and self-rule. They pressed on for love and home and country the main streets, the schoolyards, the churches, and neighbors, the families, and communities that gave us men such as these. They were sustained by the confidence that America can do anything because we are a noble nation with a virtuous people 
praying to a righteous God. The exceptional might came from a truly exceptional spirit. The abundance of courage came from an abundance of faith. The great deeds of an army came from the great depths of their love. As they confronted their fate, the Americans and the Allies placed themselves into the palm of God's hand. The men behind me will tell you that they are just the lucky ones. As one of them recently put it, all the heroes are buried here. <clears throat> but we know what these men did. We knew how brave they were. They came here and saved freedom. And then they went home and showed us all what freedom is all about. The American sons and daughters who saw us to victory were no less extraordinary in peace. They built families. They built industries. They built a national culture that inspired the entire world. In the decades that followed, America defeated communism, secured civil rights, revolutionized science, launched a man to the moon, and then kept on pushing to new frontiers. And today, America is stronger than ever before. Mark Lubin. Remember the last time you got a quote-unquote free phone? You started out feeling great, then came the hefty activation fees, four-line requirements, and, of course, the binding contract. Don't fall for it again, folks. Only Pure Talk gives you a free 5G Samsung Galaxy phone without the feeling you've been duped. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and unlimited data plan with Mobile Hotspot for just 55 bucks a month and get a 5G Samsung Galaxy for free. That's right, unlimited everything at a fraction of the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. Here's another thing. You'll be on America's most dependable 5G network. How do I know? I'm a customer. Make the switch to Pure Talk, the wireless company I'm proud to stand behind, because they're proud to stand behind me and you. Just dial pound 250 and say Mark Levin, and you'll get a free Samsung Galaxy when you sign up for unlimited talk, text, and unlimited data. Again, go to puretalk.com, use promo code Levin Podcast, L-E-V-I-N Podcast, to start saving today. The biggest financial institution in the United States is called BlackRock. It provides finances to corporations to expand, invest in capital, purchases their stock sometimes, and they do it by running pension plans, among other things. If you're a nurse, if you're an administrator, if you're a police officer, if you're a firefighter, your emergency personnel, it's likely that your pension programs are managed by BlackRock. There are others. But BlackRock manages about $10 trillion in assets. The CEO of BlackRock is a gentleman by the name of Larry Fink. And they've been using their power and their influence and their pressure, and their threats over these corporations that they lend money to or invest in to push the radical left Marxist agenda. You might see these advertisements by BlackRock. They're on places like Fox and other cable channels trying to convince you that they're just a wonderful apple pie and motherhood type company that cares about blue collar America they hate you 
They hate you. So back in November 2017, Hat Tip Western Journal, great site. I want you to listen to what the CEO Larry Fink said. And then you'll understand why some of these companies are doing what they're doing. Now, they're doing it because they want to do it. Don't get me wrong. But they're being subsidized by BlackRock, by your pension monies, among other things, to push this radical agenda, this ESG agenda. Cut one, go. You, you now make a point of that's, a, that's an investment criteria for you. Well, behaviors are going to have to change, and this is one thing we're, going to, we're asking companies. Uh, you have to force behaviors, and at BlackRock, we are forcing behaviors. Uh, 54% of the incoming class are women. We, we added four more points in terms of diverse uh, employment this year. And it, if it, it, you know, what we are doing internally is if you don't achieve these levels of impact, it, your compensation could be impacted, okay? We're doing the same thing. And so it's just, it, you have to force behaviors. And if you don't force behaviors, whether it's gender or race, or just any way you want to say the composition of your team, you're going to be impacted. And that's not just not recruiting. It is development, as Ken said. And ultimately, it's still going to take time, but I am just as much shocked as Ken is that we have not seen more opportunities. And we're going to have to force change. It's a great Leninist. We have to force change from the top down, ladies and gentlemen. We have to impose our will. And he's not just talking about gender. He's talking about, of course, transitioning. He's talking about the whole panoply of Marxist agenda. That's what's being forced by Larry Fink at BlackRock. More when we return. Remember the last time you got a quote-unquote free phone? You started out feeling great. Then came the hefty activation fees, four-line requirements, and, of course, the binding contract. Don't fall for it again, folks. Only Pure Talk gives you a free 5G Samsung Galaxy phone without the feeling you've been duped. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and unlimited data plan with mobile hotspot for just 55 bucks a month and get a 5G Samsung Galaxy for free. That's right, unlimited everything at a fraction of the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. Here's another thing. You'll be on America's most dependable 5G network. How do I know? I'm a customer. Make the switch to Pure Talk, the wireless company I'm proud to stand behind because they're proud to stand behind me and you. Just dial pound 250 and say Mark Levin, and you'll get a free Samsung Galaxy when you sign up for unlimited talk, text, and unlimited data. Again, go to puretalk.com, use promo code Levin Podcast, L-E-V-I-N Podcast, to start saving today. Mark Levin, radio's hell-raising intellectual. Call now, 877-381-3811. You're hearing a lot of the word kamikaze lately in the same sentence as Chris Christie. And you're hearing that because we started it here. For months I've been saying he'll be a kamikaze candidate just trying to take out Trump and DeSantis. Haven't I said that, Mr. Producer? It's all over the place now. Rush used to call it an echo chamber. It starts right here and spreads out. It's exactly what happens. I want to play this again because I I rushed it at the bottom of the last hour and I want to get into this more. BlackRock. I want you to remember that name. BlackRock. It's not hard to remember. It's this massive, I think it's the biggest financial institution in the world. And it uses your pension monies, many of you, particularly if you're in the public sector, but also in the private sector. He uses these pension monies to provide capital, loans, investment dollars, purchase stock, and so forth of many major corporations in this country. And the CEO there, Larry Fink, that's not a hard word to remember. In fact, his first name should be Rat. Rat Fink. By the way, who is white. He's so concerned about diversity. It's another rich, white, left-wing kook. And he's saying, look, 
we're forcing behaviors. We're forcing behaviors. And so you see the clothing show up in the children's section all over the country in different major department store chains. And you're pushing back exactly as you should be. Companies have to make decisions. It's either Larry Fink, who's helping to destroy the culture, or it's the customers. But there are Larry Finks all over the place. There are rat Finks all over the place. This guy is just such an egomaniac and a publicity hound. He drew attention to himself. Now, again, they're running ads all over the place. Black Rock. And you'll see kids riding their bikes and families, and they're out in parks. They're having a grand old time. It's propaganda. This guy's no damn good. He's no damn good. And Ratfink, if you want to come on the program, we'd love to have you. Here we go. Cut one, go. You, you now make a point of, that's, a, that's an investment criteria for you. Well, behaviors are going to have to change, and this is one thing we're, going to, we're asking companies. Listen to how sanctimonious this little bastard is. You know, I know billionaires, and I know billionaires. I know many of them. Not by choice. They contact me for the most part. And most of them are very, very kind people. Very smart people, very driven people. But every now and then, you meet a real slob. A real bully. A real egomaniac. Some of them look disheveled. They can barely speak. Not most of them. Some of them. This guy dressed up in a suit and a jacket. When he should be wearing camouflage out on the street. Part of the Antifa crowd. And yet he's in charge... You know, you folks out there, you ought to find out who is managing your pension monies, <clears throat> particularly if you're in a union. Who is managing your pension monies, ultimately? Well, you might say, well, my union is. No, it's not. No, it's not. They pay for a group like BlackRock to do it. And BlackRock makes money all over the place. It makes money as the manager of your pension funds, and it makes money turning around, taking that same money and loaning it to this company or buying this investment and so forth. So we're going to, well, behaviors are going to have to change, and we're going to make them change, damn it. This is why DeSantis is so smart. He went after Disney. He knows what's going on with Disney and Iger. And these financial institutions that are behind them? He says, no. Chris Sununu's too stupid to understand it. Chris Christie's all for it. Chris Christie hasn't lifted a finger to fight the culture wars. I don't even know if he could lift a finger unless he was eating a hot dog. But you get my point. You get my point. Start at the top, please. Go. You, you now make a point of, that's, a, that's an investment criteria for you. Well, behaviors are going to have to change, and this is one thing we're, going to, we're asking companies. Uh, you have to force behaviors, and at BlackRock, we are forcing behaviors. Uh, 54% of the incoming class are women. We, we added 54% of the incoming class are women. He doesn't say we have the smartest class we ever had. Why don't you force those behaviors? He's not saying we have the most motivated class we've ever had. Why don't you force those behaviors? The most innovative class we've ever had? Instead, we have 54% women. Who cares? We have to force behaviors. And by picking groups of people and emphasizing that over individual merit, you're destroying individualism and you're pushing groupism. When you're getting an operation, do you care if it's a woman or a man? Do you care what the person's race is? You just want the best surgeon you can get. 
Am I correct? Now, I think liberals should have to live by the behaviors that they're forcing. I think people based on physical characteristics should be operating on them, not based on merit. This is going on in our medical schools now. It's going on in our law schools. We're going to have an entirely new generation that will one day be running the country. And this will be their mindset because pieces of crap like Rat Fink Larry are forcing behaviors like he's some kind of God. And there is a very few number of politicians, even conservatives, who are willing to stand up to it. And when they do, they come under attack by our own rhinos. Go ahead. In terms of diverse uh, employment this year and it will if it's you know what we're doing internally what if you're one of these people who doesn't get a job because of their diverse employment practices you want to build a career you have a family to feed you have all the interests of any human being you've gone to school you've worked hard you want to get a job at black rock And you're passed over. Is that the American dream? No. You don't have an opportunity. That's exactly why we're supposed to believe in a colorblind society. That's exactly why you you choose people based on individual merit. That's exactly why God gave each and every one of us free will. Larry Fink doesn't know most of the people that they're hiring over there at the $10 trillion BlackRock. But he's proud of his statistics. He's proud of his statistics. Go ahead. If you don't achieve these levels of impact, your compensation could be impacted. Okay. So in other words, we have quotas around here, as well as quotas that we impose on other companies. We're the biggest financial institution on the face of the earth, and we have a ton of clout. Don't screw around with us. Don't screw around with us. We're here to change behaviors. Nobody elected us. Nobody even knows we're doing it. Nobody even knows who we are. This is what I mean by corporatists, which I've been talking about for 20 years, and this is what I mean now that they're the enemy. They're the enemy. You know, Charles Payne was on my show on Fox Sunday. He made a brilliant point. You would think it's obvious, but it's not. The automobile industry, while it seems to be squawking about the switch from fossil fuels to electric vehicles, they're going to make out like bandits. They're going to change the fleet of cars, millions and millions of cars, over a very truncated period of time, and force people to buy their new cars. The government's doing that, and they're really all in. They're all in. Because they don't care. I'll make more money. Have electric vehicles. Go ahead. Same. And so it's just, it, you have to force behaviors. And if you don't force behaviors, whether it's gender or race or just any way you want to say the So here's a white male guy going on about forcing behaviors. So sick of being lectured by pukes like this, aren't you? Another billionaire who's smarter than everybody else. You ever bump into a billionaire? Most of you haven't. They're dumb as a rock. And you think to yourself, how did you make the money? Because they're stupid lucky in some cases. Stupid lucky. Go ahead. Team, you're going to be impacted, and that's not just not recruiting. It is development, as Ken said. And ultimately, it's still going to take time, but I am just as much shocked as Ken is that we have not seen more opportunities, and we're going to have to force change. 
All right, Mr. Producer, I want you to save this clip, and I want you to invite Larry Fink on the program. Or is he another coward like Chris Christie? I want you to invite Larry Fink on the program. If I were a betting man, we wouldn't have, uh, it's unlikely. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Remember the last time you got a quote-unquote free phone? You started out feeling great, then came the hefty activation fees, four-line requirements, and of course, the binding contract. Don't fall for it again, folks. Only Pure Talk gives you a free 5G Samsung Galaxy phone without the feeling you've been duped. Just sign up for Pure Talk's unlimited talk, unlimited text, and unlimited data plan with Mobile Hotspot for just 55 bucks a month and get a 5G Samsung Galaxy for free. That's right, unlimited everything at a fraction of the price of Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. Here's another thing. You'll be on America's most dependable 5G network. How do I know? I'm a customer. Make the switch to Pure Talk, the wireless company I'm proud to stand behind, because they're proud to stand behind me and you. Just dial pound 250 and say Mark Levin, and you'll get a free Samsung Galaxy when you sign up for unlimited talk, text, and unlimited data. Again, go to puretalk.com, use promo code Levin Podcast, L-E-V-I-N Podcast, to start saving today. We've got a lot more going on here. We've got about 30 seconds left before the break. I want you to hear what Bill Barr said on CBS this morning. None of us watch it. Uh, but he's out there on every network that will take him, and they'll all take him, because he's out another kamikaze to take out Trump. That's his goal. That's what he hopes for. He will be a footnote in history and a very ugly one at that. I'll be right back. Here. Now, broadcasting from the underground command post, deep in the bowels of a hidden bunker, somewhere under the brick and steel of a nondescript building, we've once again made contact with our leader, Mark Levin. Hello, America. Mark Levin here. Our number, 877-381-3811-8. What is it? 877-381-3811. Well, we'll do this. I'll do uh, a little hit here, and then we'll move along. Bill Barr wants attention, so we give it to him. He's on CBS This Morning. That's the name of the show, CBS This Morning. He's on there today. And I just want all the networks out there. I want MSNBC and CNN to know, NBC, ABC. Airport radar, sonograms, Bill Barr is available. He's available to attack Donald Trump any time, day or night. Just make sure you properly load up the green room with donuts. Look, I I happen to know. I'm I'm the chairman of FU, Fatties United. I happen to know. I happen to know what this guy demands in in the green room. He's on a diet. Just the chocolate frosted donuts only. I can hardly blame him. In the right light, he looks like Chris Christie, if you ask me, Mr. Producer. But what do I know? When I interviewed Bill Barr, he couldn't have been nicer. But now he's a disgruntled former employee. You know, it's one thing to have the views that he has, but then ask yourself, why is he going on enemy media anywhere he can to push it? Because he wants Trump in prison, that's why. It's another explanation. A former friend of mine also writes over there at National Review. He's a legal analyst from time to time. Same thing. Same thing. So here we have Bill Barr on CBS this morning, today. Cut for go. But does it say to you that an indictment is near? Do you believe that I it's suspect near? it's I suspect it's near. I've said for a while that I think this is the most dangerous legal risk facing the former president. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if I had to bet, I would bet that it's near. You believe there is enough evidence? Well, they won't indict if there's not enough evidence. But from what I've seen, uh, there's substantial evidence there. There you go. So he's giving cover 
to a corrupt Department of Justice, a corrupt FBI, and a corrupt prosecutor. Uh, from what I've seen, there's substantial evidence there. There you go. Was there substantial evidence in Hillary's case? Yes. What happened? Was there substantial evidence in Bill Clinton's case? Yes. What happened? He likes to say, well, if, if Trump had responded quickly and wasn't screwing around, he probably wouldn't face this. Wow. What a professional way to approach this. Wow. And Joe Biden, was he screwing around? When he took documents out of the Senate skiff, is he facing a threat of a charge? No, no, no. Of course not. It's just appalling to me, the disloyalty. And, of course, the hypocrisy. You know, these other presidents, and Hillary Clinton wasn't even a president, and Biden was vice president at the time. It's amazing. He doesn't go on these shows and say, look, there are, there are certain serious inconsistencies here with past cases. No. Nope. This is a one-off. He doesn't say, you know, when I was attorney general, he wouldn't have done this. Which I know my former attorney general would not have. Nut no, doesn't say that. He's asked the question, and, uh, yeah, yeah, I think this is the one. Uh, yeah, they, they have the evidence to, to indict him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. And apparently he thinks the way that this guy goes about getting testimony from lawyers and so forth is okay. Doesn't bother him who the judge is. Doesn't bother him that she does it at the last day and then leaves office. None of it. None of it bothers him. Okay. He deserves it. He should have responded quickly. Quickly. You heard the beautiful words of President Reagan and Donald Trump. The 40th anniversary and the 75th anniversary of D-Day, you've heard almost nothing on television today. You've heard almost nothing from any politician today. You heard Chris Christie, or you're hearing about it, announced for the presidency on this day, which I think was, nobody will say it but me. You know, that, that Ron DeSantis, what a bumbling technology there. I mean, that, that was kind of a screw-up, and that went on for three days. It's an irrelevancy. But here, Chris Christie, it's not a screw-up that he announces on the anniversary of D-Day because he doesn't even know it's the anniversary of D-Day. Or if he does, he's clobber, he's, he's clod-hopping all over the damn thing. Like a Budweiser, what are those horses called? Clydesdale. I don't think we're allowed to talk about Budweiser anymore. Ron DeSantis is at a press conference on Digital Bill of Rights today. Listen to this. Cut 10. Go. We, of course, knew during COVID that they were censoring people who were speaking out against lockdowns, speaking out against mask mandates, speaking out against school closures. But what I think we learned in the intervening time is that this was not just tech doing it on their own. They were actually working with people like Fauci and working with people in the government. And so they were basically doing the government's bidding in terms of stifling dissent. You cannot, as a government, subcontract out restrictions of speech to a private company and say that that's somehow okay. It's not okay. And so that basically is a violation of the First Amendment when they're acting as an arm of the state. And we saw that with COVID. We also saw it with the suppression of the Hunter Biden um, story uh, in the 2020 election. That was FBI and DHS working with these companies. And basically, they were the ones uh, spewing misinformation and they were censoring truthful information. So the fusion of government and tech for the purpose of censoring uh, things that descend from the official narrative. That's a huge, huge threat to freedom of speech in this country. Mm -hmm. Cut 11, go. But what we've seen over the years is they take that liability protection, they say they're not publishers, and then they put the thumb on the scale in, front of, in, uh, in favor of one perspective. 
And if you're offering conservative dissent, you could get stifled. You could get taken down. If you dissented from the COVID, official COVID orthodoxy, they would take you down. They would try to stifle you. And so that is taking, I think, liability protection and abusing it. So what our bill just said is, look, if you're an open platform, if that's how you're advertising, you can have rules in terms of what you want or not want, but you got to apply those evenly. And if you're discriminating against uh, people with viewpoints, points you don't like, uh, then they have an ability uh, to seek redress. Mm -hmm. Very good. By the way, once again, I want to thank you Levinites out there for watching Life, Liberty, and Levin. The numbers keep coming in, and we keep doing fantastically. We are not losing audience. And uh, I just, uh, the the fact that I'm blessed with you, you're so loyal, And we continue to do this show, and I think you're going to be fascinated with this coming Sunday show. We're going to have uh, Jim Trusty on the program, one of President Trump's lawyers on the documents case. And uh, Marco Rubio, (coughs) who hasn't been on the show in a long time. Um, But I think uh, they're going to be terrific. Uh, But Trusty, given what's taking place, I think it's uh, very, very important. And so he will be on the program. I will not have Bill Barr on because he says the same damn thing. Yes, I. Uh, I think that uh, that's the the worst case for the former president. And yes, I think the evidence is there to charge him. Yes, yes. And I think convict him too, because what Bill Barr knows, and what I know, is if he's charged in Washington D.C., he'll be convicted. That's also what the Biden administration knows. Not a word from Bill Barr about the interference of one candidate in another candidate's election. Doesn't even affect them. Not a word by any of the legal analysts. Not a word. We've never seen anything like this. Or the fact that the so-called special counsel should never have been appointed because, as we've talked about till I'm blue in the face... The basis for appointing a special counsel is not what Garland did. The special counsel should be appointed to investigate Biden and all these front groups and everything else, or front accounts. You don't appoint a special counsel to investigate a political opponent. I've read the the title to you. I've read it word for word to you on this program, and he should know. Of course, he doesn't raise any of these things on CBS either. He won't be invited back. And damn, they got good donuts in that in that green room. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. Southern Poverty Law Center, which has been really disgraced with controversy in the recent past. Former head of the organization had to resign under numerous allegations and lawsuits. And of course, this organization, uh, what you may have thought of it half a century ago, is one thing. Today, it is a hack, radical left, Democrat Party operation that smears conservatives, that smears people of faith, that smears organizations that believe in this country and they're doing it again over at the daily signal breaking hat tip to my wife southern poverty law center adds parental rights groups to their hate map the southern poverty law center which brands mainstream conservative and christian organizations as hate groups placing them on a map with chapters of the ku klux klan added a slew of parental rights organizations to that so-called hate map for 2022 and labeled them, quote, anti-government groups. Whatever you do, don't be anti-government. No, no, no. Can you imagine the founders of the country? Southern Poverty Law Center would have said, oh, look at these white supremacists. Quote, schools especially have been on the receiving end of ramped up and coordinated hard right attacks, frequently through the guise of parents' rights. The SPLC's year in hate and extremism report claims. Let me get this straight. So now your right wing 
if you do not want pornographic books in the elementary school library. Now you're right wing if you do not want drama queens dancing around the cafeteria in the assembly room in front of seven-year-olds. Now you're right wing if you don't believe your children should be sexualized in kindergarten and in elementary school. So now these perverse groups, these perverse individuals, these radical Marxist organizations, they're trying to mainstream that which is not mainstream. And they're trying to accuse people of being Nazi-like and KKK-like if they dare to raise questions about what is being done to their children in these damn union-controlled government schools. Oh, you're a threat. They go on, these groups were in part spurred by the right-wing backlash to COVID-19 public safety measures in schools. See what I mean? Right wing, right wing. How dare you raise questions about masks? How dare you raise questions about the consequences of vaccines? How dare you raise questions about children being banned, banned from classrooms? Despite the fact that the likelihood of them getting the virus, let alone dying, is almost zero. How dare you go against Fauci, how dare you go against Washington? How dare you go against the teachers' unions? You must be a Klansman. Ready? You want to hear more? At the forefront of this mobilization is Moms for Liberty. This group, Moms for Liberty, is fantastic. So they're trying to take them down. They are fantastic. They have galvanized mothers across this country, different political affiliations and parties, all races and so forth. Moms for Liberty. I mean, that's apple pie stuff. A Florida-based group with vast connections to the GOP that this year the SPLC designated as an extremist group. Moms for Liberty. Why? Because they're moms and they're for liberty. They can be spotted at school board meetings they write across the country. Wearing shirts and carrying signs that declare, we do not co-parent with the government. Isn't that true? I think the Southern Poverty Law Center would be very, very comfortable in Cuba and Venezuela. Very comfortable. I think they'd be very comfortable in Iran, in North Korea, enforcing the government say so. The SPLC report does not once mention the left's aggressive promotion of sexualized material for children in schools and at other venues. It does not mention the drag queen story hour movement or the fact that many of the books which parents demand uh, uh, demand removed from school libraries include pornographic content. It does not mention how many on the left champion the idea that children should be able to identify with a gender opposite their biological sex, hide that identity from their parents, even obtain life-altering drugs without parental consent. Instead, it acts as though the parental rights movement emerged in a vacuum, or worse, is motivated by hatred. And I might add, nobody is stopping Democrats from embracing these movements. Nobody. It's amazing how the Democrat Party says nothing in opposition. The SPLC long has demonized conservative Christian groups. Yeah, I think it's anti-religion. It's bigoted. Such as Alliance Defending Freedom, as anti-LGBT hate groups, national security groups such as the Center for Security Policy, as anti-Muslim hate groups, and immigration groups such as the Center for Immigration Studies, as anti-immigrant hate groups. The SPLC's 2022 report released today, includes a new designation, the anti-government movement. Oh, my. I'm sure it's going after Black Lives Matter and AOC. Hidden anti-government groups make up the extreme edge of America's hard right, they say, an inherently anti-democratic movement that rejects pluralism and equity. Do you reject equity? 
The movement instead strives to build a society dominated by hierarchy. White people whom far rightists deem lesser or threatening. Women, black, brown people, LGBTQ people, non-Christians and others are socially and politically subjugated. The hard right has the advantage of building an already existing structural white supremacy, as well as its persistent and regular manifestations in everyday life and in politics. What a bunch of pieces of shingles here. And you know who they're speaking for? The Democrat Party. They're speaking for groups like Media Matters and Mediaite. This is what they believe. The SPLC report includes 523 hate groups, 702 anti-government extremist groups, for a total of 1,225 organizations. The Mark LeFan Show, the pool feed for the conservative media. Dive in now, 877-381-3811. Out in California... You know, this guy Newsom, he's not only the most overrated, he is, they've had morons like Schwarzenegger, Jerry Brown, a couple others, but they've had great governors, Pete Wilson, Duke Major, and of course, Reagan. But this guy Newsom is like the worst of the worst. He has taken everything that California has built up over the decades. California, here I come. Where everybody east of California wanted to live in California. They wanted to start a business in California. It's a fantastically beautiful state. The weather's unbelievable. Tremendous opportunity. And now it's run like the North Korea of the United States Brownouts and blackouts, water shortages. These are the necessities. These are the basics. Banning common consumer goods. Banning the combustion engine. Soviet-style little Politburo commission set up to control what you can do. They used to promote free love. Now they promote free crime. Free drugs. Probably the most beautiful city in America, San Francisco, is now a fecal hill. A fecal hill. One of the most inviting tourist attractions. You did the shopping there, and only the best stores, they're all gone. People don't want to go to the wharf. They don't want to go anywhere. The, the most fantastic hotels, plays and movies, just dead. You're lucky to get in and out of there without being beaten, robbed, threatened, your car broken into. My wife and I were there about a year and a half ago. We couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe what we were seeing. I went to an event. It was one night. I rarely go. We drove through and said, oh my God, what the hell's happened in this place? In 10 years. In 10 years. Absolutely ruined the entire city. You look at L.A. I mean, L.A. was always a tough city. But anybody outside of L.A. now does not want to go to L.A. And now California is losing population. And if you didn't count all the illegal immigrants pouring over the border, they'd be losing multiple congressional seats. They've destroyed what was. And I say this as an individual who was born in Pennsylvania, raised in Pennsylvania, lived most of my adult life in Virginia, have a fantastic Home in Florida, California was the most exquisite state in the Union. 
And now it's a disaster. Democrat party rule. Supermajority. One party rule. It's one party state. And there's Gruesome Newsom, the governor. Took the finances of the state, the institutions of the state, inherited all this magnificence, and bled it dry. Used up all its funds, destroyed all of its institutions. He and his party. The Daily Caller, church sues after governor pulls support for anti-hunger program over its orthodox religious beliefs, quote-unquote, about sex and gender. What is it? They don't want kids to have sex until they're old enough? Is that it? Wow. By Kate Anderson, a church in California that runs a food program for students. Fought a lawsuit last Friday against the U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA, and the state's Department of Social Services, this is in California, for revoking federal funding over the church's beliefs on gender and sexuality. The church at Compassion and El... K-O-J-O-N... C-O-J-O-N... El Cajun, California, runs the Day Spring Learning Center, which receives 3500 to 4500 in federal funding for a food program for its impoverished preschool students, according to the lawsuit. In December 2022, however, the center was suspended from the USDA's Child and Adult Food Care Program, that would be Biden's USDA, claiming that it was not compliant with the sexual orientation and gender identity non-discrimination provisions, prompting the church to file their lawsuit on June 2nd. Excuse me? Sexual orientation and gender identity? Non-discrimination provisions? It's a church! The center had participated in the USDA's program for nearly 20 years, according to the lawsuit, but in 2021, the department issued a new regulation, that would be Biden, that amended Title IX to include sexual orientation and gender identity. Additionally, in May 2022, the department also sent a Policy update to all state directors of the USDA's food and nutrition service programs. And I quote, prohibiting discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. Folks, they're feeding little kids. They're being defended by the Alliance Defending Freedom. I believe this is one of the groups that's said to be a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center, by the way. The Church of Compassion failed to meet these requirements during the application process for 22 and 23 school year due to its, quote, orthodox religious beliefs regarding human sexuality, according to the lawsuit. That would rule out most Muslim organizations, most orthodox Jewish organizations, most practicing Catholic organizations. An October notice from Jesse Rosales, chief of the Child and Adult Care Food Programs, the California Department of Social Services further explained that by not complying with the non-discrimination policy and requiring, quote, employees to read and abide by a handbook that specifically disallows lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender lifestyles, the church would lose thousands in funding for its food program. You see, we have BlackRock, either you buy in, we have the federal government, either you buy in, We have a blue state government. Either you buy in or we're cutting you off. A lawsuit, Alliance Defending Freedom, the legal firm representing the church, argued the department's decision violated the religious rights of the church under the First Amendment. They said the government's withholding food from families in need simply because their children attend a Christian preschool. Ironically, in the name of combating discrimination... Government officials have excluded the church and preschool preschool from serving the El Cajun community based solely on the religious beliefs and exercise. This is antithetical to the First Amendment's promise of religious freedom and only hurts needy families and children. But they don't care about needy families and children, ladies and gentlemen. They could care less. You see, these are haters. 
represented by a hate group and a hate church that are raising little hate children. According to the SPLC and their ilk. Amazing, isn't it? No, it's not. It's sickening. It's disgusting. I'll be right back. Mark Lovin. There is a shooting at Virginia Commonwealth University during a high school graduation ceremony there. Seven injured in the shooting. Two people were in custody in the shooting. Happened on the campus, but... Uh, At the high school graduation, seven people were injured in a shooting. Virginia Commonwealth University campus after a high school graduation ceremony was held there. Two people were in custody, police said. Three of the victims were being treated for injuries thought to be life-threatening. Four had non-life-threatening injuries, police said. Uh, The shooting took place at Monroe Park, an open space on campus at 5.13 p.m. Eastern Time. Huguenot High School's graduation was scheduled to be held at 4 p.m. today at the Altria Theater adjacent to the park, according to the school's website, NBC News reporting. In a notice posted to the Richmond Public Schools website, the district said the shooting took place in the park after the graduation ceremony. It said all district schools would be closed Wednesday and all high school graduations this week have been canceled. Uh, State and local police were at the scene. It's all I know. It's all I know. All right. Let's see here. I'm going to take a call or two if we can squeeze them in here. Hold on one second. I'm pulling them up. Hello, everybody. How you be? All right. Let's go to Leona in Fort Smith, Arkansas, the great KWHN. Go. Uh, Yes, Mark, I wanted to ask you. I wanted to ask you if you feel that the Civil War is imminent due to the constant, unrelenting attacks against President Trump. No, I don't think a uh, Civil War is imminent, <clears throat> but I do think the country is, um, how can I put this? I think it's unraveling, and people don't know what to do. And I think that the... The Marxist left, under the umbrella of the Democrat Party, just keeps pushing, pushing, tightening, tightening, uh, as they use these various uh, cultural institutions that they control against people who don't want to be controlled. You see BlackRock, the corporatists, you see what's going on in our schools, you see how their organizations just trash mouth anybody who disagrees with them. The Democrat Party today is not the Democrat Party of 40, 50 years ago. It is literally hostile to almost everything in this country. And it is a huge problem. But I don't see an armed civil war happening. Excuse me, I just don't. Um, And uh, for a lot of reasons, including the fact that most people are, you know, they're, they're, they're civil, even though they're upset. I mean, if we can get people just to do the basics, like vote, get people out to vote, organize in their communities, join parents' groups if they're parents, join convention of states, that would be a big deal. So I don't think people are ready for the other. Thank you for your call, my friend. Ron. All right, let's go to Greg. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the great WJAS country. Go right ahead. Hey, Mark. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, big fan of the show. Thank you. Um, I know we don't have a lot of time. So basically the point I'm trying to make is if uh, conservatives are taking ta- taxes seriously, why aren't we seeing any push for uh, the repeal of the 16th Amendment? The repeal of the 16th Amendment would require, if we go through Congress, three-fourths of both houses of Congress. You think we can get three-fourths vote in the House? I I don't think so. You think we can get three-fourths in the Senate? I'm not saying we will get it. You understand I have a proposal under Convention of States, which would even be better. 
would put a flat cap right on top of the whole thing that could not be violated. Take a look under at it. It's the Liberty Amendments. I believe I could be wrong. It's Chapter 2. All right, folks, we salute our armed forces, police officers, firefighters, emergency personnel, the freedom fighters in Ukraine and in Taiwan, and all of you. God bless you, and I'll see you tomorrow.